Hey all, this is Reddit Oscar. At the time of recording, there is about 18 days left until the Elden Ring DLC. For some of us, the destined day is fast approaching, but for others, I'm sure time has slowed to a crawl. And that is going to get a lot worse as we proceed, because there are people that intend to watch no more Elden Ring content. I've seen many people say to themselves, you know, I've seen enough. I don't need to look at any more. I don't want to see any trailers. I don't need to watch any of the previews or impressions or reviews. And those people are about to have the opportunity to demonstrate their remarkable willpower because the previews are credibly reported to be coming out on June 4th. So to help alleviate the heavy burden of waiting, I'm going to recommend to you three different games. Each one of these games have elements that are appreciated in Souls games, but I've tried to make sure that they don't overlap too much with Elden Ring. I've selected these not just for their quality, but to prevent burnout for the coming DLC. The first game I'm going to recommend is Tunic. There's an old story about Hidetaka Miyazaki, the director of Elden Ring. The story is that when he was a child, he was poor, and his parents couldn't afford to buy him books or manga, so he would go to the library and check out whatever books he could find. He ended up reading fantasy and sci-fi books in English, he didn't understand English, and so he would look at the pictures and imagine the story that might accompany the images. Miyazaki has said that he found great joy in those stories, and that they were a rich reading experience even if he wasn't actually reading. He later cited this experience as a major influence on his design philosophy. And I mention this because Tunic evokes this feeling. It evokes it better even than Elden Ring. And that's because Tunic has a runic language and almost all in-game text is in that language with only a few bits and pieces in English. And this includes items in your inventory, signs, dialogue, and most importantly, your in-game manual. Scattered across the world are pages for the instruction manual of the game. It's meant to be reminiscent of old games like Legend of Zelda. Just like in those game manuals, it's filled with useful information. It has context for the story. It has a lot of maps, it has monster descriptions and item descriptions, it has explanations for controls that are not immediately apparent. It is an invaluable item, and the best thing about the manual is that it's mostly in the runic language. It's inscrutable, with only key phrases and words in English, which causes you to stare intently at this manual. You will look at the pictures and you'll look at the words that you can see in English, and you'll try to infer their meaning. Let me give you an example. There are accessories in the game, like rings, and if you equip them, they'll have effects, but you're not told what those effects are. Thankfully, the manual has a few pages that show that equipment and the names are in English. So if you really wanted to know what the accessories do, you can look at the name, you can look at the image of the accessory, and you can try and equip it to experiment yourself. In this way, you might be able to infer its effect. There are also situations where you might assume you can't proceed because you don't have the right item, but sometimes it's not at the item that you're missing, but knowledge carefully perusing through your manual might reveal the information on how to proceed. The wonderful manual even gives you context for the story. There are pages describing the events of the game and what you're doing and why, but it's all in the runic language. You can decipher the language if you wanted to try hard enough, but more likely you'll be like Hidetaka Miyazaki. You will experience what he experienced. You're going to stare at those images and look at the few words that you do understand and try to imagine what the story is about, and try to imagine what the game is trying to tell you. And for me, that was phenomenal. The pages are dispersed carefully by their developers in places where they think you should have them, because it's a real risk to design a game this way. You can't afford to have too many players miss out on picking up important pages when the manual is so critical to the experience. But I think they did a good job, because I never felt like I was missing content or context for gameplay or story. The best part of Tunic is this communication of information through inference. I constantly felt like my brain was awake. And that's rare in a game, because as you play a game and you become accustomed to its mechanics, even high-paced combat can become effortless. But with Tunic's focus on inference, I was always on the lookout for familiar patterns. Now the game, apart from the manual, is still good and interesting. The combat is Souls-like. You have stamina management and blocking and parrying and dodging. The exploration, on the other hand, is more like an old Zelda where you're in a openish world and are free to wander, but your access to certain areas is restricted. The combat and the exploration are solid on their own, but it's really how they're integrated into the manual and really how the developers communicate information to the player that makes it shine, that makes it really stand out amongst its peers. 
Alright, next game on the list is Kingsfield 4. In Dark Souls 1, one of the things that people talk about the most is that moment when you get to the Undead Parish and you find an elevator. At this point, you've been exploring for a while, you've cleared the Undead Burg, you've cleared most of the parish area, maybe you went a little into the Dark Root Depths and came back. Either way, now you've gotten to here and you get on this elevator, and then you go down, and you realize that it brings you back to Firelink Shrine. And at this point in the game, you don't really have access to fast travel. And so a shortcut like this is immensely valuable. And not just from a gameplay perspective, you are awed at the interconnectivity of the world. It's such an impressive moment that people continue to talk about it and moments like it in Dark Souls. Anytime something leads into somewhere else that you've been, people clap like seals. And they're right to, these moments have impact. There is a group of Souls fans that lament how ubiquitous fast travel is in the later games. Because with no limits, the fast travel makes situations like this less valuable. In fact, sometimes it reduces their value to zero. And if you're one of the people that feels this way, if you're the type that looks at Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 and misses the limited fast travel and special weirdness of those games, then you should play Kingsfield 4. The Kingsfield series is what From Software were doing before they made Dark Souls and Demon Souls. Many people consider them a prototype to those games. The controls to those games are clunky, the overall gameplay is slower, it doesn't have a focus on boss encounters, and the gameplay is slow and boring looking focusing mostly on proper spacing and strafing attacks of enemies. It actually isn't as boring as it appears. You get used to it quickly, and it has its own kind of tension, since the slowness in the controls makes it difficult to keep track of multiple targets, and there's the added element of resource management over long periods. But those really aren't the big appeal. What makes Kingsfield 4 shine is its exploration, its level design, and its atmosphere, which is, in my opinion, better than any of the other From Software games. And I can say that free of bias, because Kingsfield 4 is not a game from my childhood. I played it this year. And I maintain its exploration and atmosphere is better. The dungeons in Kingsfield are massive, sprawling, interconnected monstrosities that would make a Dark Souls game weep with envy. Everything that people like about From Software dungeon design is present here. And because the combat isn't exactly riveting, all of their effort went into the dungeon design and the tone of exploring these dungeons. The premise of the game is that you need to explore the long-abandoned ancient city and place an idol at its center to prevent catastrophe to your kingdom. There are various smaller side areas, but the ancient city itself can be viewed as one gigantic dungeon with many attaching thematically different areas that interweave back into the main ancient city dungeon. It's always both a rush and a sigh of relief whenever you have explored another area extensively and then find that it leads you back to an area that you've been to before. And now, given the things that you got in that side area, you can proceed down the main area further. The game also boasts an excellent soundtrack that does a great job of setting the right tone for each area you explore. If you've ever watched one of my videos and listened to a song in the background and thought to yourself, damn, that's a really good song, and have gone to the comments to ask me about it, I'll tell you what it is right now. It's Dark Reality. It's always Dark Reality from Kingsfield 4. Alright, the last game that I'm going to recommend that you try before Elden Ring DLC is Outer Wilds. And this is a very challenging game to recommend because we Outer Wild fans are insufferable. We insist on not telling you anything. We're deathly afraid of giving spoilers because spoilers are particularly damaging to this game. It actually can affect gameplay. And it's a difficult game to describe even if we weren't worried about spoilers, because there's not a lot that is like it, and its appeals are difficult to describe. So if you meet a Outer Wilds fan and they're trying to get you to play this game, like they always do, they're just going to tell you, for the love of God, just don't ask me questions and go play it. Don't, don't look anything up, just go play it. And that's also going to be my advice. But I'm going to tell you a small part of the premise of the story, and then afterwards explain why spoilers are so damaging. The premise of Outer Wilds is that you're a Harthian, a fledgling race of blue-skinned bipedal aliens. Your species has just recently developed the ability to travel through space. Outer Wilds Ventures is the organization created to send astronauts into space in the hopes of improving 
Harthian understanding of other planets, and the Nomai, an ancient race of aliens whose ruins can be found throughout the solar system. The astronauts, then, of Outer Wilds Ventures are part explorers and part archaeologists. You are the space program's newest recruit, and the game begins on the day of your first solo launch. The Harthians recently managed to translate Nomai writings, and so you're going to be the first person to understand what the Nomai writings actually say. When you get on your ship and go off into the solar system, you'll find that the solar system has several planets. Your ship moves in a realistic way. The planets work in a realistic way. Newtonian physics are at work. Gravity has an expected effect on you and other things. But you're an explorer. You're not given a direction to go in. You're completely free to go in whatever direction you want and investigate whatever you like. Whatever you choose to do, you will soon encounter a specific problem. This problem will change the context of the game. And the goal of the game will be about investigating the various mysteries of the different planets in an attempt to figure out what you can do to deal with this problem. Now at this point I will say no more. There's a video that I made that goes more into depth on Outer Wilds, and it spoils more to get you more interested. But like everyone else, I insist that you just trust me and go play and finish the game. The reason spoilers are such a touchy subject in this game is that the game functions similarly to a Metroidvania, in that you are locked out of certain areas until you have the right power-up to explore those areas. But Outer Wilds doesn't have any power-ups. The only thing it has is information. And so technically, you can visit any area at any time, but you don't know how. And so as you explore the game, you'll discover information that will work as a power-up, that will let you do things and access different places that itself will have more information. What this means is that this game has a replayability of zero. At least for most people, I can't replay it, because I already know all of the power-ups. Once you know something, it's spoiled forever. And so spoilers are something we desperately want to avoid, because the story is really interesting, and because the spoilers actually damage the gameplay. And so I will say no more. I'll just say, go look at how other YouTubers and people gush about this game, how they refuse to tell you anything about it, and how they insist that it's a masterpiece and one of the best games of all time. Their emphatic insistence should be all the evidence you need that you should listen. Alright, that's the end of this video. As always, thank you very much for watching.